Part of my criteria for covering a piece of hardware on this channel is that it has to be weird to some extent. Whether it's an SD card shaped camera or a tablet running Windows XP, it's just way easier to talk about something totally unique than just another beige box. And boy do I have a weird one today. At least weird in appearance. Say hello to the Gateway Profile 5.5. Since 1999, Gateway had been toying with all-in-one designs for their line of profile computers, most likely inspired in part by another fairly popular all-in-one computer of the time. At any rate, these machines were pretty standard in terms of specs, but since the profile design required fitting all of these components into a smaller space, and also included a pricey flat panel display built right into the device, they typically went for over $2,000, at a time when most home computers were reaching sub-$1,000 prices. Still, the profile line was able to gain some traction, specifically with business users and in educational settings, where the machine's compact design was a huge selling point. And so, the world was graced with not just one, but six different versions of the Gateway profile, each with its own hideous early 2000s design. Perhaps at some point I'll collect the whole lineup, but for this video I chose to buy the Gateway Profile 5.5, in part because it's visually one of the least objectionable of the six, and mostly because it was on eBay for $12. Being an all-in-one PC, the profile certainly lives up to its name, with a footprint of only 12 by 6.5 inches. Of course, to make up for this narrow space, most of the computer is actually built vertically behind the display, giving it this hunched-over shape. It's also pretty heavy for its size, weighing it at 23 pounds for the whole computer. That weight includes a lot, though. From the 1280 x 1024 17-inch monitor attached to the top of the case with an adjustable mount, to the floppy and DVD drives along the base of the computer. To save space, as well as cut down on the weight of this thing, the power supply is actually a pretty sizable external box that connects to the back of the machine using a non-standard plug. A complication that showed itself when I first bought this thing, only to open the box and discover I didn't have a way to power it. Thankfully, in my case, I was able to get my hands on a power brick for free. The profile has no shortage of ports on it, including four USB ports on the back, PS2, Ethernet, Serial, Parallel, and VGA, though we'll get to that one later. Along the side, the profile also has a few more USBs, Firewire, and a slot for PCMCIA cards. Given I was looking for a machine that would be easy to run older software on, I deliberately chose a profile with a 3.5 inch floppy drive on the front. However, profiles could also come with the more modern option of a card reader in that spot instead. The machine also had a Wi-Fi option, but unfortunately mine doesn't seem to come with it. So in addition to adding Wi-Fi, I'm also planning on doing a few other hardware upgrades to the machine. Increasing the RAM, replacing the hard drive that came with the thing, and after all that's done, installing a new OS. Let's get to it! Thankfully, despite the profile's all-in-one form factor, making hardware modifications to it couldn't get much simpler. It takes just four Phillips head screws to remove the backplate of the machine, after which you already have access to most of the computer's easily upgradable components. Just to give you guys a better view though, I'm also going to take off the fans to expose the rest of the motherboard. You can see there's the CPU under the big heatsink. In this case, it's a 2.8GHz Pentium 4. I was originally planning to upgrade it to a much faster quad-core Q9400, but sadly, given the time this profile was released, it was just a bit too early to support any of the Core 2 chipsets. That limits my upgrade options to just a few slightly faster Pentium 4s, which I didn't really think would be worth my time. As for the RAM though, it's easy enough to replace. A few satisfying clicks, and each 256MB stick has now been upgraded to 1GB each, meaning 2GB overall for this machine. The maximum this motherboard can support, and more than enough to run Windows XP. I just gotta get the fan enclosure back on, and we're all good with everything on the motherboard. As for the hard drive, it turned out to be even simpler than upgrading the RAM. The enclosure slides right out of the base of this machine, and it's just a quick swap from one drive to another. And there we go. The hardware of this machine, and more importantly the case, prevent me from doing any major modifications like changing the motherboard or adding in a newer graphics card, but still, upgrading the RAM should make this machine much more capable for some of my future plans. I also did want to add Wi-Fi to this thing as well, so really quickly I'll plug this little USB transceiver into the back. Alright, everything's together and it's time to test, and... no BIOS beeps. Yep, looks like everything's working. Alright, all we need now is an operating system. Now the Profile 5.5 was released in 2005, which means that it would normally be running Windows XP, so I figure that's what I'll go with. The XP installer didn't appear to have the proper audio drivers for the Profile, so there unfortunately wasn't any of that groovy XP setup music, but hey, that's what post-production is for. I 
After a bit of waiting in silence, the machine finally hit the XP desktop, which at 640x480 is pretty comically cramped. Luckily, the graphics and audio drivers for the Gateway Profile are relatively easy to find online. I loaded them onto a flash drive, and after having a bit of fun trying to view the whole installer UI in 640x480, everything finally rebooted into the correct settings. <sighs> that sound will never get old. Speaking of sound, the audio hardware in this machine is actually pretty decent. The profile has two 3 watt stereo speakers in the bottom of the case, and although they can be a little quiet, they do throw sound pretty well compared to most built-in speakers I've seen. In fact, the back plate of this machine has a line-in jack, which means that you can actually use the computer as a speaker to another device, like the iPad, for example. What song is this? Four guys. By the Beatles, when are you going to do a favorite- The profile isn't just limited to audio pass-through, though. You might recall that I pointed out the VGA port on the back of this machine. But that port isn't actually for a second monitor. Instead, you can plug the VGA output from another computer into the profile and use it as a monitor, switching between inputs by a button under the display. This effectively turns the profile into a KVM switch between itself and another PC, allowing you to have two PCs without eating up a ton of desk space. It also works as a pretty unique future-proofing measure. Whenever the profile became obsolete for whatever reason, you could just buy a new PC tower and plug it into your existing hardware. As for what you can do in the standard profile though, at least in terms of typical Windows XP applications, the machine is pretty competent. You've got your standard, boring office applications, but of course the hardware isn't limited to just that. Just like the TC1100, it can handle basically any early 2000s casual game you can throw at it. As for games with 3D graphics, some it handles well, and others, well, <laughs> the embedded Intel GMA900 really tries. You can see Portal here is being run on really low settings, and not the screen's native resolution. But to be perfectly honest, the fact that Portal ran at all was surprising to me, given that it refused to start in the TC1100. And after all, what do you really expect from a computer aimed at the professional crowd? It can run games, it just doesn't run some very well. The media capabilities of the profile are pretty standard for the time, too. The machine struggles a bit playing high-definition video, but it can handle standard definition no problem. The DVD drive along the front of the machine is also a nice addition, turning the profile into a really compact movie player with little to no trouble. After the RAM upgrade, the profile also handles streaming video from YouTube somewhat alright. It still has frame rate issues, especially with anything above 480p, but given it came out at the dawn of the 240p YouTube era, the profile would have been perfectly fine at keeping up with online video. As for music though, the profile is really great right out of the box. The equalization for some songs doesn't sound quite right, but for internal speakers they sound pretty good. Plus, the volume buttons right on the front of the machine are a welcome addition. Paired with the trippy music visualizations from Windows Media Player, the profile actually makes a really nice self-contained music player. In fact, that's generally what I've been using it for since upgrading it. Certainly not the intended purpose of the computer, but it does the job well enough. Overall, I'm pretty glad I went with buying the Gateway Profile 5.5. I paid around $30 for the upgrades and $12 for the computer itself, which brings the total for the entire machine to about 40 bucks. A little more than what I paid for the TC1100 without upgrades, for a much more powerful machine that should be pretty helpful anytime I need something a bit older to test software on. It may not be a powerhouse, it may not be upgradable, it may not be that lightweight, but for a Windows XP machine with just enough hardware to tinker with, it'll do for me. Plus, if I decide the computer itself isn't all that great, I still got a pretty nice VGA monitor out of it anyways. Oh, and I'm sure a bunch of you noticed that there's a column of dead pixels on the screen. I've personally learned to just ignore it, but I figured I would wait until the end of the video to mention it, just to spare any of you lucky enough not to have noticed from being distracted by it. <laughs>